Hi. In today's podcast, we're going to talk about something that students often ask me about, which is operations for colorectal cancer. And what exactly is what operation? So today we're going to cover right hemicolectomy, but in other podcasts, we're going to talk about uh, left hemicolectomy, anterior section, uh, abdominal perineal excision of rectum and Hartman's procedures. Um, but before we do that, we're going to talk about a few underlying general principles to do with uh, resection and uh, and why we do them. So the first thing uh, is just I've uh, prepared this diagram earlier. I'm not a very good drawer, so you're going to have to bear with me a bit. But you can see here that um, we've got a, a colon. Here's the ileum coming into the colon, into the cecum here. So that's down in the right hemisphere fossa, and it goes at the ascending colon to the hepatic flexure, across the transverse colon, which is obviously a bit more dippy than this normally. And then the splenic flexure here, down the descending colon, gets a bit wiggly down the sigmoid colon, into the rectum, and out through the anus. Now, it's very important to understand the development of the blood supply to the bowel. And there are three main vessels uh, supplying the bowel, and this depends on their embryological origin. So the foregut is supplied by the celiac trunk. I've not put that in here. Uh, for the sake of uh, simplicity, but the celiac trunk comes off the uh, aorta around T12 and uh, supplies the foregut, so uh, the lower end of the esophagus and the stomach and down to the second part of the duodenum. And then uh, the midgut takes over and runs from the second part of the duodenum uh, all the way down the small bowel, all the way up here to about two thirds of the way across the transverse colon or maybe around the splenic flexure in the artery in the midgut is the SMA, the superior mesenteric artery. And that leaves the aorta around the L1 vertebral level, comes down here and it gives off uh, a middle colic branch, which uh, divides multiply and quite early uh, to supply the uh, hepatic flexure and across the transverse colon and carries down here. In not too many, about 10 or 15% of people, a branch is given off here called a right colic, but that's often absent, as we, as we said. Carry on as the uh, superior mesenteric artery, giving branches off the small bowel as you go along the small bowel. And then it ends up as the ileocolic artery, which, as the name implies, gives a few branches to the uh, ileum, will supply the appendix, and will uh, also supply the um, right colic, uh, the right side of the colon here. So that's the ileocolic. And you'll notice that there's, uh, the vessel goes along here, and it forms a good anastomosis with the right colic that's present and certainly the middle colic and then the anastomosis continues all the way uh, around the colon and this is called the marginal artery of Drummond and it's very important for when we do resections that when we divide the vessel we still have some anastomosis to supply the bowel. Three most important things about uh, colonic anastomotic healing being blood supply, blood supply and blood supply. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the SMA, that's the artery of the midgut. The hindgut starts around here, about two thirds way across the transverse colon, splenic flexure, and then the hindgut goes all the way down here up until we get to the dentate line, which is the uh, embryological remnant of the gut pushing downwards and the skin in the uh, the cloaca pushing inwards and uh, joining it to form the anus itself. So the IMA comes off about L3. It's two or three centimetres long and then divides into the, uh, the left colic branch or ascending colic branch which uh, turns up and towards the splenic flexure and gives off branches this way to supply the colon and then uh, the, the rest of the vessel carries on here, gives branches to the ascending colon, the sigmoid colon and ends up as the superior rectal artery which comes and supplies uh, the top uh, and middle of the rectum. The middle rectal artery here is not uh, commonly there again only in about 10 or 15 percent of the patients and the inferior rectal is a branch of the internal pudendal artery and um, that supplies the lower anal canal and is the vessel that um, keeps the uh, hemorrhoidal tissue full of blood okay so there's uh, the, th the three vessels the celiac trunk which supplies the foregut the superior mesenteric artery which supplies the midgut and the inferior mesenteric artery which supplies the hindgut and as I accidentally flipped on to earlier Today we're going to talk about right hemicolectomy. Now, also we just need to know some uh, underlying principles. And so what do we do when we do cancer surgery? Well, 
pretty obvious here really we need to remove the primary tumor completely and we need to do that without damaging surrounding structures and then we need to remove the lymph nodes which drain the tumor and there are a couple of reasons for this the first is that uh, if we leave lymph nodes full of tumor sitting there then they will continue to grow and we inevitably get a regional recurrence of the cancer and uh, and so we uh, we uh, take out lymph nodes to, in order to stop the, the cancer growing uh, in what we've left behind and also it's very important that we know whether there is tumour in these lymph nodes so that we can give a stage to the tumour so you may know already that um, <clears throat> tumour that spreads to lymph nodes is a Duke stage C tumour or uh, in the TNM classification it's N1 or N2 depending on the number of lymph nodes involved and we'll probably cover that in a future podcast and this is important for prognostic reasons um, so your five-year survival if you have lymph node involvement is between 30 and 50 percent depending on whether you're n2 or n1 or whether you're uh, duke stage c1 or c2 and if you have if you have got lymph node involvement then uh, we would normally recommend all of things being equal that you have some adjuvant chemotherapy to um, help the eventual cure of your tumour. Handily for us we know where these lymph nodes are and they are found alongside the named arteries. Right so right hemicolectomy this involves me drawing a bit so you're going to have to bear with me slightly. So we've got the terminal in there, cecum starts to come round like this and down the anus so ascending colon transverse colon obviously dips down a bit more like we've said descending colon sigmoid colon into the anus right so there's the aorta and off the aorta comes the superior mesenteric artery the artery of the midgut and heads off there Eventually, being the ionic colic artery, and uh, gives off branches like this to the small bowel, to the terminal branch of the ionic colic to the ileum, and then curves around there, runs along the medial side of the bowel. There might be a, a right colic artery in some people, but more commonly, as we said, a middle colic artery being divides, <coughs> runs around and anastomoses with that and then also another branch of it runs along the transverse colon towards the spinal flexure and then we'll anastomose with the inferior mesenteric artery branches around here okay so we've got SMA there it's quite hard to write with these pens and middle colic artery there okay and that's the IA colic artery there right so let's have a look and put our tumour in. Right then, for the sake of argument, we'll mark our tumour as a blue lump that sits here, sort of in the middle of the ascending colon, for argument's sake. And there's a the tumour there. So our principles are: we need to remove the tumour in its entirety without damage surrounding structures, but also remove any lymph nodes to which this tumour might drain. And so it might drain along. This vessel here, we also said it, it drains the lymph nodes travel with the named arteries, so there might be lymph nodes along the ileocolic colic artery we need to remove, but also along this branch of the middle colic artery. And you see the tumour may invade and be drained by lymph nodes going both ways. So we need to take both of those. So if we're going to remove uh, this, uh, this bit of artery here and this bit of artery here, it's really important that we have some viable bowel left. And so all this bowel down here going to be non-viable it's not going to have a blood supply and so we're going to have to divide the bowel around there so it's supplied by this bit of vessel and around here so it's supplied by this bit of vessel and then divide the, the vessels themselves there and there and all this then goes off to the lab and the pathologists have a look at it for us and what they're going to tell us is confirm absolutely that this is a cancer and they're going to have a look on the microscope at that and they're also going to tell us the T stage which runs a 1 to 4 and 
um, the T stage is how far through the bowel wall the tumour has invaded. Uh, T4 means it's right out in the serosa, T1 means not very far in at all. And the end stage, which is either 1 or 2, and that depends on the number of lymph nodes involved. Um, and uh, if the lymph nodes are involved, it would be uh, a duke stage C. And if the very top node that you took away was involved, then it would be duke stage C2. And that makes the prognosis a bit worse. And so uh, if lymph nodes are involved, then there's about a, if uh, it's an N1 or a duke stage C1, and about 50% five-year survival. And if the apical node involved or it's an N2, then that probably drops to around 30% five-year survival. So it's important to know for prognosis, but also for treatment. Remember, if we've got a, a, sta a T4 tumour, so there's fibril cancer cells on the serosa, on the serosal surface of the, of the bowel, then we would probably recommend some chemotherapy if the patient's fit enough. And if it's in any of the lymph nodes, we would again offer some uh, adjuvant chemotherapy to the patient. So it's important in prognosis, but also planning future treatment. Okay, so anyway, that's going to leave us with two ends of bowel there. So what are we going to do with those? Well, uh, on the right-hand side, we want to be able to join them up. And so we can, uh, if we just see now here, we've got this end of bowel here like this, uh, which is the uh, transverse colon, and an end here, which is the uh, terminal lining. And what we want to do is join those two back together again. And so there's all sorts of ways to do this. You can do it, uh, to just stitch that end onto that end. So you have a terminal in like that, transverse colon like that, and just stitch the two together. Obviously, you're going to you pull those two together, and so they just join up. Uh, or what I prefer to do, a lot of people prefer to do, is a side to side anastomosis. So the terminal in uh, is like that. There, the terminal in and the port alongside the transverse colon which runs down across there like that and then out to the anus and then you've got a staple gun in here or you can, can sew it if you like in there and bring those two edges together and then cut down there so the staples join that together so you look at that from the end if you're going to do stapling is you've got two lumens there and you bring them together and then you fire the staple gun and it cuts the staples across there and so you have just a one lumen like that with a communication across it so if you look from the side um, you can see there's two bits of bowel like that and they're joined together down the middle and so there's a terminal in there's a transverse colon that's joined together there and so the fecal stream can come up from the stomach side of things go across anastomosis and then go down to the anus and so that's a side to side anastomosis the important thing is that the uh, the bowels join together and the fecal stream runs through now there should be no tension on that anastomosis you should also check there's a very there's a good enough blood supply uh, as I said earlier the three most important things about anastomosis you know blood supply blood supply blood supply it's not being just ever so slightly facetious it is desperately important because there will be no healing without a good blood supply and so at day five or so after the operation, the uh, staples are going to give a bit and you're going to get an anastomotic leak. And so what we have at the end is, now what we have at the end is this, and the terminal in runs down here, like this, and it's joined on an anastomosis with a transverse colon. And it runs out there to the anus. And there we have it. That is right hemicolorectal knee. Right hemicolectomy. Um, I'm much better at writing than this in real life. Okay, so that's it from the School of Surgery uh, for this podcast. We have the podcasts on other colorectal operations. Uh, you can visit us and like us on Facebook or visit us and join us on Podomatic or follow us and subscribe to our podcast through iTunes. Okay, I hope you uh, enjoyed it and if you would like to see anything else, then please let us know and we'll do our best to do a podcast 
on uh, any surgical topic that you feel you need some uh, further help with.